Okay, I usually let my class review this material, the material from this power plant on their own. I don't usually lecture to it, but I've decided to do a video lecture to a, a few slides from this power plant. I'm not going to cover the entire thing. I am going to discuss um, a couple of experiments, three experiments that you may find a little bit confusing when you review them. So I wanted to make sure that you understood them uh, well enough. So I'm going to talk about the experiments that have to do with identifying DNA as the hereditary material, because at the time that these experiments were done, they didn't know what the hereditary material was made of. They knew that there was hereditary material, that something was being passed down from generation to generation, from cell to cell, but they didn't know what material that was, what was it made of. So there's a whole series of experiments that are listed in this PowerPoint. And I just want you to know that I don't expect you to memorize dates with this. Um, what I really want you to understand is um, the name of the person and what their contribution was to um, the field of molecular genetics. So again, no dates, you'll not be asked about dates, just matching names to what they did. And with the experiments, just understanding how the experiments worked. So I'm going to go to, I'm going to skip ahead. I'm going to skip ahead to where they first start talking about transformation. So this is with Griffith. And um, they knew at this point that the nucleus contained the hereditary material. Um, they knew that the, the um, nucleus contained a molecule that was phosphorus rich, the DNA molecule, and they knew that the nucleus also had proteins, but they didn't know which one was the hereditary material. So he did a series of experiments that led to the discovery that DNA was the hereditary material. Um, so he was really the first one to start to identify DNA as the hereditary material, although there was a few other experiments afterwards that helped confirm that. So if you look at his experiment, he worked with the bacteria, bacteria that causes uh, pneumonia, and he used two strains. So as we know from previous grades, uh, strains of bacteria can differ a little bit in their genetics. So we have the S strain and the R strain. The S strain is highly pathogenic. That means pathogenic means it, it can kill. It causes the disease. But if you heated it, it became non-pathogenic. So heating it caused it to not uh, uh, kill or be or cause sickness. The R strain is always non-pathogenic. And what he noticed is when he injected a mixture of the two types of bacteria um, into a mouse, a mouse died. So he concluded that the S strain somehow passes on its deadly properties to the R strain. And he called that the transforming principle. So I think it'll be a little bit easier to understand if you look at a diagram. This is taken from the textbook that we use here at the school. Um, and so you can see that you have a mouse and it's injected with the S strain, which is pathogenic. So that means the mouse dies. But if you heat up the pathogenic S strain and give it to the mouse, the mouse lives. If you give the non-pathogenic R strain of the bacterial cell to a mouse, the mouse lives. But what was weird to him, what was confusing to him, is that when you put a mixture of the heat-killed strain and the live non-pathogenic strain, then the mouse died. So he concluded that this heat-killed bacteria somehow was passing information to the live non-pathogenic R strain that was turning it into a pathogenic strain of bacteria which would kill the mouse. So he really didn't understand what was being passed, but he just concluded that something is being passed from the uh, dead uh, pathogenic strain to the live non-pathogenic strain. And what we understand now, and what you may have learned about last year in grade 11, is there's various ways that bacterial cells can pick up DNA. So what was really happening is that these bacteria that were killed by heating them up, they probably underwent lysis and their DNA molecules went out into the uh, solution and that was picked up by the 
live non-pathogenic strain and, and basically converted it or transformed it into a pathogenic strain. And that's what killed the mouse. So that is Griffith in his transforming principle. So if we jump ahead, if we skip a few experiments, and now we we jump ahead to these three scientists. They they look at they took a look at his work and they did some additional research to try to determine what type of molecule is involved in this transformation. So they grew that heat killed S strain bacteria in liquid cultures and they extracted the contents of it, but then they separated the contents into three different extracts and to each of them, they added a different enzyme. To one, they added an enzyme that destroys proteins, another one destroyed RNA and another one destroyed DNA. And then they added the live R strain to each extract. So let's take a look at how this experiment worked. So they took the heat killed S cells. So these are the cells that were originally pathogenic, but they were killed. They put them into a uh, culture. And then they added the proteinases, which destroyed proteins. So this sample would contain RNA, DNA, but no protein. To this one, they added a ribonuclease, which destroys the RNA. So this sample would only contain DNA and protein. And to this one, they added deoxyribonuclease, which destroyed the DNA, so it only contained the RNA and the protein. Now remember, it also contains the heat killed S cells. Then they added the R cells to each of it. And when they added the R cells here, they looked to see whether or not S cells appeared. And they did here, which means it cannot be the protein that is causing the transformation because there's no protein in this sample. Similarly, they found that there is an S cell, S cells formed here, which means that RNA could not be the transforming principle or the transforming agent because there was no RNA here. But in this sample, they saw no S cells appear, which means that there was no transformation that occurred here. The R cells were not able to pick up any, anything that caused them to transform to the S cells. So it must be the DNA that is the hereditary material. So in essence, they prove that DNA is the hereditary material. Now that being said, there had to be further work to further confirm this. So we move on to Hershey and Chase and their famous experiments. And they worked with uh, bacteriophage, which is a virus that infects bacterial cells. You may have learned this back in grade 11. And uh, you also learn in grade 11 the structure of viruses and how they're made of uh, a, a protein coat that surrounds uh, an RNA or DNA core. And they work by attaching to a cell and injecting their genetic information into the cell to take it over, to hijack the cell. They didn't know at that time what was getting injected into the cell, what's causing the uh, bacterial cell to get infected, what is moving from the virus into the bacterial cell. We now know that it is DNA, but at the time they did not know. So they wanted to prove, is it DNA or is it protein that is getting into the bacterial cell? So here's how their experiments worked. They, in one set of experiments, they radioactively labeled DNA with phosphorus. So they added some radioactive phosphorus to the DNA molecule. Then they allowed the virus to infect the bacteria then they uh, collected everything and ran it in a centrifuge that separates bacteria from viruses. The bacteria settles at the bottom and the viruses settle on the top. And what they noticed is that the radioactivity was at the bottom, which means it was the bacteria that was radioactive, which means it's the material that was made radioactive in the virus that got into the bacterial cell. And that was labeled with phosphorus, so it must be the DNA that got in. In another set of experiments, they did the same thing, but this time they did not label phosphorus, they labeled sulfur. And when they did the same set of experiments, they noticed that the radioactivity was still with the viruses that did not get into the bacteria. That means that the protein did not get into the bacteria. So this further proved that DNA is the hereditary material because it's the DNA that gets into the bacteria that causes the transformation, if you will, of the bacteria to be infected with the viral genetic information. Now, of course, why did they pick phosphorus and sulfur? Because DNA only has phosphorus, protein doesn't. DNA does not have sulfur, only protein does. So that's why they chose those elements. 
So I hope that clears up maybe some misconceptions